If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrelf, here with an updated deck list for my Esper Awaken Control deck. Now, this is my favorite deck that I've ever run in a standard environment, and I've been playing since... Uh, Lorwyn. So that's maybe saying a little bit. That being the case, this deck has some very clear strengths and some very clear weaknesses. Well, let's get started. We have our lowest curve spell. You can already see one of the weaknesses in the deck. We have four Anticipates, just to give us some selection, give us that card draw that we need to find our answers, and in the later game, find our threats. Very simply, if you're running a blue control deck, you run Anticipate. Makes sense, right? Next, we run Scatter to the Winds as a 4 of. This is just a counter spell. Helps us to fight. We need this in certain matches. We need some mainboard counter spells. And this also serves as a win condition, potentially. Although the creature that's made from the Awakened will die to Fiery Impulse, which is obviously seeing a lot of play. Nevertheless, this does give us a win condition we can use. Uh, the deck that we needed against the most while it's still around is Seasons Past. Absolutely, 100%. If that card ever resolves against us, we'd probably just lose the game. Yeah, it speaks for itself, right? We need some mainboard counterspells. We have some mainboard counterspells. Next, I used to run Sweep Away in this slot in order to fight uh, Landfolk and Gideon ally of Zendikar. Now, the reason for I need l removal against those is because, well, it's their instant speed, right? They're only a creature on my opponent's turn, th the vast majority of the time at least. Landfolk, I suppose, could be, but not usually, let's face it. But I couldn't use, so I couldn't use Royal Spout, which is another Awaken, puts it on top of the deck, and Kill spells like Ruinous Path won't work there, so I need something else. I ran Sweep Away for the tempo, especially against Landfolk. But, a friend of mine, shoutouts to you, Josh True Love, which, as far as I'm aware, that is his last name, True Love. <laughs> or at least that's what's on Facebook. Told me, he didn't, he didn't put it bluntly like this, but, look dude, you should be running To the Slaughter instead. And he's absolutely right. To the Slaughter is where it's at. Now, it doesn't hit a specific creature, right? If they have multiple creatures or multiple planeswalkers, or without delirium, a creature or a planeswalker, there's a lot less selection. And so in that sense, it's less versatile, but this is instant speed, and with delirium, it becomes a two-for-one that hits their planeswalkers. That is still technically, you know, a two-for-one, but it feels like a lot more than that when you're hitting such a powerful card. And especially if that card happens to be Gideon, which is one of the bigger weaknesses to this deck. It's why we ran that sweep away, after all. Uh, next we have Ruinous Path as a 4 of. We still have to have it. More Planeswalker kill, more creature kill, and a win condition. Awaken 4, 7 mana, kill one of their creatures or walkers, and get a creature yourself that can be used to just close out the game. If you get there, you're in good shape, right? So, with these as our first two removal spells, these are Ruinous Path is spot removal, to the slaughter is usually, it's not spot removal, but it's low to the ground, usually a one for one, hopefully a two for one later on. But this, this we need against the aggro decks. We run three languishes in here, just to wipe their board. Seems good, right? <laughs> Seems like something we sort of have to run. I've lost many a game to not being able to take out my opponent's deck early on when they've just you know, solidified their board presence and I couldn't push them back to start taking over the game thereafter. That's the biggest weakness to this deck, right? If the opponent can get out early enough with, say, a burn deck or a human's deck, we need something like Languish to stop them in their tracks and then take over the game from there. Now, three Languishes. We also run two planar outburst. So, you want to use language to kill most of their creatures, for everything else, there's planar outburst. Yeah, and it serves as a win condition later on in the game. It is five mana, however. 
So yet another Awakened 4 destroys all of the non-land creatures, which makes sense in an Awakened deck like what we're running. Um, yeah, if you make it up to 5 mana, between Languish and Planar Outburst, you should just have the game. I've taken out Descend Upon the Sinful because I've lost too many games where I had Descend in my hand and it being 6 mana meant that I couldn't actually use it over the course of that game. However, Languish and Planar Outburst, they're of course much more castable, Languish especially. This used to be a 1 of in the list, it's now 3 because I think that we need it that badly. Now, for the pillar of the deck, the glue behind the deck, there's Narset Transcendent as a 4 of, a 4 of Planeswalker. There are 11 Planeswalkers in this list, 6 unique ones, and this gets to be a 4 of. The reason is because of her plus 1, right? That's the main reason. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a non-creature, non-land, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. Well, we run 0 creatures. We run 0 spells that are creatures. Every, if you're going to miss with her, it's going to be on a land. Everything else is a hit, so you've better than a coin toss's chance to hit off of her. Plus, her minus two gets really insane, especially with Languish and Planar Outburst, where it can sort of just read, Time Walk the opponent. Not really, but usually, right? You rebound a Languish, and for two turns, they aren't going to be able to stick a creature. That's the kind of tempo that you need, right? Just stall a turn? Next we have, oh and by the way, if you pop her ult, often that just wins you the game, obviously. There are enough creature decks in the format that it doesn't necessarily do that, but it wins the control mirror right there for you. Next we have two Obnixilis Reignited, card advantage, creature kill, and a win condition, all on a five mana <laughs> awesome walker. Gotta love it. Sort of speaks for itself, I suppose. Next, we have another win condition one. We have Soren Grim Nemesis for even more hand advantage, right? Even more card advantage. The plus can just be the win condition all on its own. You don't even necessarily need to pop his ult. It certainly helps if you can, but just keep hitting other Sorens, not, keep hitting your planeswalkers and your kill spells, and you could just win the game right there. Seems pretty good. Also, his minus X should just keep the opponent off of you with whatever you know, threatening creature they have. Only a two of, as well. It is six mana, and it isn't the glue that holds us together like Narset. Uh, but it, it is rather good, I'd say. Now, certainly, if you... Well, I'm about to show you another one. In addition to this list, from Eldritch Moon, we have a one of Liliana the Last Hope. Just a one of. She's our lowest CMC walker, of course. She serves as additional removal, effectively, with her plus. Up to one target creature gets minus two, minus one until your next turn. So she kind of protects herself a little bit. Put minus two. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Now, as I said, because we're running four Narsets, we don't have any creatures in this list. So the minus two doesn't really do you any good. However, I'm considering a version of this list that takes out one, just one, Narset Transcendent and adds in Kalidus, Traitor of Get, and this just gives you a creature that you can keep recurring over and over again. You can do the same with, say, Dragon Lord Silumgar or Dragon Lord Ojutai, but I would be trying out Kalidus, partially because of Kalidus' ability to wreck their graveyard, partially because of the lifelink to give us life back from when we're losing it due to, say, Obnixilis, and early low-to-the-ground plays, and partially because it can get itself to be rather huge. You know, it turns our kill spells to the Slaughter Ruinous Path, Languish, eh, a little bit tricky with the four toughness, uh, it turns those into tutus that just take over the game for us. So, if you're taking out one Narset, try out Kalidus. There are some advantages to that. You'd only have one creature, so hitting off of Narset is still better than a coin toss. All Planeswalkers are effectively legendary, so taking out one Narset means that you're less likely to have that as a dead draw, uh, which is certainly, certainly true. And Kalidus is a powerful card on his own. There's a reason why he's as expensive as he is. 
Next we have a one of Gideon. Oh, by the way, I should note, her emblem wins the game as well. Obviously, so yet another Planeswalker that just outright wins the game. And here we have Gideon, ally of Zendikar. Yeah, this one does win the game on his own, that is true, but he's usually not the kind of walker that we want for this kind of deck. He's usually made for the mid-range decks, right? Where you use him to make tokens in the short term, and then you have an indestructible beater that can keep swinging in. Uh, in this kind of deck, he can obviously still work, especially with mass removal like Languish and Planar Outburst. I just don't think that he's as good. Still, he is worthy of inclusion. We might as well have a Gideon. I don't know about two, but one seems perfectly alright to me. And the minus four is another reason why he sees play in the mid-range decks to an awfully large extent. We get very little, we get basically nothing out of the minus four. Um, but the first two modes seem quite alright. And next we have one of Jace Unraveler of Secrets. Like Narset, he's card advantage, not a win condition. You'll notice that Jace does not have you win the game on any of his modes. But Scry 1 then draw a card is great card advantage. It has the Mind Sculptor's ability to protect itself, although instead of having a minus one for it as an unsummon, it's a minus two. So that is true. And then the emblem should just win you the game against an awful lot of decks once you've gotten uh, well established. So if you pop the ult and ever take over the board with a Languish or a Planar Outburst, they should just be out of the game because they have the, to two for one themselves just to be able to play any spell at all thereafter. Notwithstanding something that says can't be countered. Like, say, Big Mama Emrakul. Now we have three oaths in the deck, as you might imagine. We have one Oath of Gideon. Very simply, three mana. Helps to protect us in the early enough game by putting out two blockers. And then makes all of our planeswalkers come out with another loyalty counter. They come out a little bit bigger. That seems pretty good. Now we're only running these as one ofs because they are legendary. Uh, next we have one Oath of Jace. Draw three, discard two, put some cards in our graveyard, although now that Descend Upon the Sinful is not in the deck, the only real benefit we get from graveyard shenanigans is to the slaughter, but that, that is nevertheless a benefit. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, scry X, where X is the number of planeswalkers you control. We have six unique planeswalkers in this list. I have scryed five when there were five walkers. This lets us scry six. You should not lose the game if you get to ever do that, right? <laughs> Simply enough. And then, thank you, Eldritch Moon, Oath of Liliana. I'm glad you changed your mind and decided to join, because this gives us yet another way to kill their creatures. And at the beginning of each end step, if a walker entered the battlefield under my control this turn, I get a 2-2 zombie that does not come in tapped, that's important, onto the battlefield. That's great, because it lets our... Planeswalkers protect themselves without having to use one of the protection modes on them. So in the case of Jace, for instance, it feels bad when you have to minus two just to keep him alive. Or Sorin minus Xing or Obnixilis Reignited minus three just to keep themselves from dying. Oath of Liliana gives you a walker, I mean gives you a zombie instead, so that your walker can stay alive on their own terms. And once they do that, that means that they should mean that they get to plus that turn anyway, and they're that much closer to going off. That's the way that I see it anyway. And why not run it? It's pretty good in a walker's deck, obviously. It's where you want to be. Now, for the lands here, we're starting off with, well, obviously, four Shambling Vents. It's just another creature. Uh, gives us lifelink, potentially, to overcome some life loss early in the game. Two power, three toughness, fights a lot of low-to-the-ground decks, and we are an Awaken control deck. If we throw counters from Awaken onto Shambling Vents and then use its ability to turn itself into a 2-3 lifelink, it'll be a 2-3 lifelink plus those counters from, say, Scatter to the Winds, Ruinous Path, or Planar Outburst. Seems good. <laughs> Seems good, swinging with that much power and lifelink. Alright, so next we have four Prairie Streams, of course, four Sunken Hollows, 
Of course. I say of course. They could be Port Town or... Oh, I don't remember the... Shadows Over Innistrad, Sunken Hollow. I don't remember that duel. Whatever that one's called. Oh, it's going to come to me right after this, I'm sure. It's not Nefalia Drown Yard. That's different. In any case, you could run those instead. The, the dynamic with those is that uh, while they're more likely to come in untapped in the early game, they're more likely to come in tapped later on in the game. The opposite is true of the Battle for Zendikar lands. They're more likely to come in tapped in the early game when we don't mind them being tapped so much, but in the later game, they do come in untapped, which is where we need them for casting higher curve spells. That's why I'm running these instead. And you can add some mixture, feel free to disagree with me, I don't mind that at all. We are running uh, four Evolving Wilds, so we're at 16 lands right now, because we have 10 basic lands. So we have three islands, I used to run four, I think they're not as consequential as another color now. Three planes. And then lastly, but certainly not least, four swamps. You're the one that's now four. And that's partially because of the switch from sweep away to, to the slaughter, making black a little bit more consequential. But also, I'm adding in Liliana the Last Hope and Oath of Liliana, and the Last Hope has black black in her cost as a three drop. So I think that having basic swamps is more important there. That being the case, maybe we still need more islands because Anticipate is our lowest cost spell. Maybe that's right. I'd be interested to see what you think. And if you have some suggestions, leave them in the comments below. We're not done with the deck quite yet. Next we have the sideboard. So th these are our 60 cards. A lot of... not sing well, a lot of singletons and a lot of just two of, you know, easy, we're playing enough draw power in the deck and enough stall that I feel that we can afford to operate under what I've heard referred to as singleton theory. Play a lot of one ofs, play a lot of answers or threats that are situational so that when your opponent goes to sideboard, they don't know what to expect. Either they see something in game one that may not show up again, is likely not to show up again in game two, or if they don't see it, they just side incorrectly altogether. But for the sideboard, we start off with two Anguished Unmakings. Very simply, exile target non-land permanent, you lose three life. For when you play against, I find play against the control decks is when they're most consequential, because the life loss means the least, and the cards you need to hit are the most important. I don't have them in the main board, because I'm worried about uh, losing enough life to low to the ground decks anyway. Uh, now, for the aggro and mid-range decks, this is six mana, but this sort of takes over the game on its own, right? Once you get there. Six mana, descend upon the sinful, exile all creatures, and then with delirium, put a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield. Seems good to me. Seems really good. The only issue is the cost, but with the other stall cards, we should be able to make it that long, and once you do, there's very little downside to running it. Once you've already awakened, the exile could destroy one of your own creatures. Well, not destroy, because, you know, exile. That's not what I mean. You know what I mean. But other than that, we don't really lose much, and even if we do, we get a 4-4 angel out of it that will then serve as another win condition in the deck. Next, we have two duress. For fighting incoming counterspells, collected company, other anguish and makings, other than major creature decks, I don't usually see myself citing these out, actually, as you might imagine. Or not citing these out, not citing them in. They have an awful lot of utility in the format right now. Next, I'm trying this out as just a generic answer, a one of imprisoned in the moon. Enchants a creature land or planeswalker and turns that into a colorless land that just taps for colorless and loses all other card types and abilities. It's just a generic answer to everything. Uh, I could use it to color screw my opponent. I could use it to take out um, an especially large creature, say a world breaker for instance, where I'm okay with it just turning into a land. Um, and I can hit planeswalkers with it. Where I would side this in, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't had the chance to test this out yet. 
but it's just a one of, a fun of in here as a generic answer. Next we have infinite obliteration, which should probably be a two of. I may take something else out for another one of these. Just hits creature decks so hard. In the collected company decks, often I'm worried about a particular creature that I'm expecting to see. That yeah, they'll cocoa, but if they cocoa into irrelevant creatures, I'm not so worried. Um, also in ramp decks, I want to take out their world breakers. In control decks, if I know they're running a certain creature and that's really their only win condition or one of just a handful, I can just take it out with obliteration. It has a decent amount of utility, but it doesn't break the backs of any decks as far as I'm aware in the format right now. And so it's just a one of. Could be two, absolutely. Next we have a one of Linvala the Preserver to beat out the aggro and mid-range decks. This should just, every time it comes out, gain us five, five life and a 3-3 three, three white angel. I wonder why it's a 3-3, three, three, to be honest. Because I think up to this point, angels had always been, or at least angel tokens, had always been 4-4s. Four Maybe it was a balance thing. Maybe they thought that a 4-4 four, four angel was just too strong. I'm not sure, but it seems weird that I had to actually go hunt for a 3-3 three, three angel token after this. But yes, just... It's our timely reinforcement on a much bigger creature, but six mana. If we can get there, we're gold, is the idea. And with Liliana the Last Hope, even if they take her out, we can just keep getting her back and getting her back. Oh, it can be silly. Next, we have a one of negate. Just generic hate. You know, against whatever, whatever might be stopping us. Need it for counterspell wars? Well, there you go. In that case, it could be Dispel. I'm trying out Negate. Negate will work on Seasons Past, or is the main reason why. Dark Petition and Seasons Past. Maybe I need Dispel instead, though. Maybe I need Invasive Surgery, if I'm that worried about those cards. But I'm trying out Negate. I actually don't own any copies of Invasive Surgery, so that's another reason. And then there is Ojutai's Command. Very simply, this should be Cryptic Command. Often it is. I find that usually I'm casting it for uh, counter target creature spell, draw a card, where it feels very much like Cryptic Command. Can't really use the first mode for anything at all in this deck. If we added some creatures to use with Liliana that maybe got some advantage out of dying, then perhaps this would make some sense. But otherwise, the modes are just gain four life, counter creature, draw a card. But it's in the sideboard as a one of. It works as a, it works great against a fair number of decks. Here's my control breaker. One painful truths in the sideboard. We're a three color deck, so we might as well take advantage of this. I think that we lose enough life in the main board that we don't want to have this in the main. Although we could certainly as just one of, perfectly all right. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. Converge, draw three, lose three, breaks the control matches absolutely does. Once we resolve that, it's obviously not Ancestral Recall, but it <laughs> feels good. Feels good. Next we have Silungar's Command, just as a one of. Again, we bring this in against a lot of decks because it works against every deck. I find it's best against Control, where the games are going for long anyway and you can get to that five mana reasonably enough, and the modes Counter target non-creature spell and destroy tar target planeswalker seem rather good. But beyond that, return target permanent to its owner's hand could just be useful anyway. I find that I use that against I've used that against uh, Landfolk to win the game against Orzov. Target creature gets minus three minus three means that we can use it against everything in the Coco deck that we oh not everything obviously, but a lot of their cards we can use it against. It hits the Landfolk, uh, especially Shambling Vent. If it seems like I'm worried about Landfolk, there's a reason for that. It's because we don't do as much to take them out. And generally speaking, you know, there's a reason why Ink Moth Nexus in Legacy is such a strong card in the Infect decks. It's because it can't be countered, and it can't be killed with Sorcery Spade removal. So, yeah, it seems like something we need some answers for. Sphinx of the Final Word. <laughs> it's just a 7-mana, 5-5, five, five, flying, hexproof. One of those 
you should win the game if this ever resolves. It's our Sigarda, I suppose. Another break the control match, uh, card. Now, summary dismissal is for Emrakul. Spe well, specifically, so Emrakul can't be countered, but this doesn't counter the spell, it just exiles it, and all other spells, counter all abilities, yada yada yada. Mostly we care about Emrakul here. If they ever get to the point where they're casting it, and we go on for long enough that they should be able to cast Emrakul ultimately against us, this just gives us an answer. So that's always nice, of course, being able to answer the uncounterable. Now, obviously, uh, if that does get down, if Emrakul does get down, the technical term is screwed. We are screwed. <laughs> because we c our instants don't work on it. Obviously, we can't use sorcery speed then. They'll take our turn. They'll make us do the most disadvantageous things that they can and tap us out. Actually, tapping us out doesn't matter because we get another turn after that. But it's definitely not where we want to be. And lastly, a one of transgress the mind, which maybe should be another duress, or should take out, I should take out a duress for another transgress, I mean to say, because this is more generally applicable in the kind of standard that we have right now. Every deck has three CMC or higher, right? Okay, and it exiles them, so that can be useful, obviously. Alright, so this is the deck as I have it constituted right now. If you have any suggestions, leave them down below. I'm going to get some sick games in with this, I hope, before it rotates. And I might even try out the one of Kalidus that I mentioned in place of a Narset. I think I will, actually. I think when I start her out, start her, the deck is a her, I guess. I was looking at Narset when I said that. I'll give it a shot with the one of Kalidus, just because of Liliana's shenanigans. I think that that'll be worth it. If it ever comes down, ooh, recursive creature seems good, dot, deck. Anyway, take care, Magic Community. I will see you later. Bye-bye. Peace out.